Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're just waiting a second or two for people to gather, but we see the we see the folks arriving and on, on our screen. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you all for joining us. We're excited about this. We've had a relationship with Jonathan Stalls, the author here, for quite some time. He's been a mentor in our walking colleges and really active in the community. And uh, we'll, we'll get to the full intro in a minute. Um, first of all, I want to thank our, uh, well, no, first of all, I'm Mike McGinn, I'm the Executive Director of America Walks, and um, I'm joined here by Nicole Smith, who's our Operations and Program Manager at America Walks, and also a bookstagrammer. You, uh, she's, she's the one who keeps our reading list full here at America Walks and recommends things to all of you. And so I know she's really excited to interview Jonathan about his book and, and his experiences and his work in walkability advocacy. And I'll turn it over to her in a second. Before that, I big thank you to the Centers for Disease Control, excuse me, and their Active People Healthy Nation program. They support these webinars. They support our walking college. They support our community change grants. I strongly recommend that you check out Active People Healthy Nation online, sign up for their newsletter, uh, stay informed. They are a tremendous supporter and ally of walkability for its uh, community health benefits and individual health benefits. Also want to thank Tool Design and EcoCounter uh, who has been supporting this program and uh, I um, also want to thank all of our individual donors. Without you, this would not be possible. Um, we, we count on individual donations for us to be expansive in what we offer to the public. So again, thank you for that. Um, if you have questions during the uh, discussion, here's how you can find it. Look for the uh, Q&A section of your user dashboard. You can write in your question. We're monitoring them. And at the last 20 minutes or so, uh, I will return to the screen and I'll help bring some of those questions forward to, to Jonathan and Nicole to field. And um, with that, let me turn it over to Nicole. And thank you all for joining us. Thanks, Mike. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. I'm just going to start out by um, giving a warm welcome to Jonathan Stahls. Um, definitely part of the America Walks family, and uh, we're just excited to have him here today. So I'm just going to share a little bit of his bio, just so you have uh, just an idea of all the amazing things that uh, he's done. So Jonathan spent 242 days walking across the United States in 2010, and has continued to move alongside thousands of people for thousands of miles. He identifies as a walking artist with his creative project, Intrinsic Paths. He also founded Walk to Connect in 2012. His work currently moves in the realms of pen and ink drawing, writing and poetry, storytelling with the Pedestrian Dignity Project, economic and racial justice organizing, training walk event leaders, guiding meditative practices, and creating long distance walking routes. His first book, Walk, Slow Down, Wake Up and Connect at one to three miles per hour, uh, published by North Atlantic Books, was released in August 16th of 2022. He is gay, queer, and resides primarily in Denver, Colorado. And uh, intrinsicpast.com is where you can find out more about his amazing art and other ventures, and um, also on Patreon as well. So welcome to Jonathan. Thanks for being with us today. And of course, I have to say I have the book here. Um, <laughs> so, hey, thank you, Fred. Um, yeah, so I'm just excited for us to, you know, have a conversation about the book. Um, you know, there may be people on here who haven't read the book. Uh, mm -hmm. I encourage you to get it and to read it. It was uh, one of my most anticipated reads of 2022, but um, also available on audio as well. And yes, Jonathan is narrating. So like, you know, it's like he's there with you. So, um, so I just want to give that, you know, plug for the book. Obviously, that's a big reason why we're here. But there are other pieces of the book um, that are going to flow into realms that I think a lot of us, if we're you know visiting this webinar today, who are in the walkability space, um, I just want to start out with with this book. What I really like is 
I say that there's like layers to it, right? So when you think of like walking, a lot of people think of just, you know, I'm going to go out, get exercise, go take a walk. But this book in the realm of walking, I know as I read it, um, I definitely, I cried. I laughed. I was curious. I was frustrated. I was angry. Uh, you know, there is just a lot of, um, it's just a roller coaster, a good roller coaster of, of emotions, but it's all around this thing called walking. Um, that means so many different things to so many different people. And I like how, um, just to touch on like the chapters, like the breakdown of the book, um, it's set up, you know, as walking as, and you touch on human dignity, humility, human right, earth care, relationship, vulnerability, play, resistance, creative wonder, presence, rite of passage, and mystery. I don't know that it, many of us have thought of walking in all of those different realms, but I want to kind of take it back to uh, one of your biggest acts of walking, I guess I would say, is your walk across the United States. Um, so just take us back there, because um, that's kind of like the opening scene of the book as well. Um, just like set the stage for us, like how did you come to this place and, you know, what did that experience mean to you? Mm. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you, America Walks. This is I, I'm so honored to be here, to be sharing this space. And Nicole, just thank you. I just love sharing space with you, friend. Um, yeah, this is, so for me, this, this journey uh, to really connecting with um, moving the way we're made to move, whether it's, you know, on foot or on a wheelchair, one to three miles per hour or, or faster or slower. Um, this was primarily a, uh, a mental health journey for me. In two, so this was in 2010 when I did this walk across the country and it was uh, eight and a half months, 242 days. Um, I grew up moving every two years of my life. So there's a lot of background story in the book. This is a very, it's a very personal, raw, creative, nonfiction piece. And I kind of get into some of that in, in, the, in the beginning and intro just to set it up. And, you know, a lot of things in my life were really difficult. I, I moved every two years growing up, being gay, queer, coming out was really, really hard for me. Being an artist, being really sensitive, all this stuff. And, you know, in my mid twenties, this was this was kind of a ticking time bomb. I, I knew that I needed to recalibrate, start over and, and seek new teachers. Um, and so that's what this was. It was really intentional to just start over. And I didn't know how, and I stumbled across the book, Walk Across America by Peter Jenkins. If those of you have heard of it, it's a classic, it's beautifully written. And, and, and it was, that was it. I, I was going to college in downtown Denver. I was, I skipped all my classes. I was feeling things, crying, throwing the book around the library. <laughs> and, um, and I just knew that that was it. Okay, this is it. This maybe is the thing that will help me recalibrate, heal some things, connect with the world outside of a vehicle. So as I mentioned earlier, I moved every two years growing up, went to 14 different schools, and most of my upbringing was kind of behind the windshield of cars. Um, for those of you that do any kind of long distance walking, it, this is uh, my backpack weighed 95 pounds when I started. <laughs> so you just, I didn't know what I was doing. And, and it was terrifying for me. Um, so I got dropped off on the Atlantic Ocean and, and, and walked things out for eight and a half months to the, to, the, to the Pacific Ocean and through the deserts and the mountains and towns and cities and learned so much along the way. So that's a little bit of the, the background story for, yeah, for how it all started for me. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, and I know one of the things that I thought, you know, when I, when I heard that you did this walk and I thought to myself, well, when did, he have to, when, when did it have to finish? you know, because everything needs a deadline, like usually people <laughs> walk faster, it's like a competition. And then, you know, it leads me into this concept of unhurried movement. Yeah. And um, I think, I know for me, like, as I was reading the book, um, you know, it was in the chapter about walking as presence, uh, about just like, just slowing down, there's a section there about being like near the water. And um, that has always been really important to me. And now I, I usually take, have this book. I have it on, okay, so I have it on Kindle. I have the physical book and I have audio. So I have it wherever I may need to be, um, you know, because the other interesting thing is there's a lot of these like invitations to just like, just be like, 
you know, like these meditative practices and things like that. And that's something, you know, working in the space of walkability, um, you know, there's a lot around like the policy and the programming and all of that. But then myself going back to the act of walking that I've always loved to do as well. And, you know, thinking about it in this unhurried way, because it's always like, I got to get this walk in, I got to go fast. Um, share with us a bit about unhurried movement. I know it doesn't necessarily mean like, you know, we're just moseying along all the time. You know, we, we do have things to do, but just break that down and the importance of keeping that in mind in this realm of walkability. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that question, Nicole. I, yeah, the unhurried frame, it comes up a lot throughout the whole book. Um, you know, the subtitle just being slowing down, whatever that means for each of us. Um, but I always, I, I always like to, I link it a lot to proximity. So thinking about, you know, proximity to the natural world, um, proximity to all the things that are going on on the inside, whether it's stress or creativity or dreaming or conflict or things, edges that we carry um, and proximity to anything kind of outside of walls and screens. And so this kind of unhurried, you know, a lot of the practices throughout the book, depending on the chapters, start with just encouraging a couple deep breaths, um, encouraging connecting to trees as sources of life, sources of positive energy, sources of stress reduction, um, you know, and so specific to the chapter walking is presence, you know, I, the, the kind of the arc of the very details of a flowing stream and breathing with trees and stumbling upon things because you have more capacity and more time. Um, but also even the proximity of pedestrian mobility and people navigating complex systems around our built environments. And so how do we notice them and feel them and not just keep it in our minds, but actually digest kind of the lived reality of, of what, what, what's going on outside of these walls and screens, you know, a little with, with more intention, with more practice, um, knowing that a lot of times, you know, our body might be slowing down, but our mind might be going even faster, you know, because we're walking and it's engaging our mind. So unhurried is complicated. And it's often in the context throughout the book, like just as a practice, it's a practice, it's an invitation um, to just how can we bring almost endless intention to something that uh, we're just so made to be doing in our minds, in our hearts, in our communities. Um, we're made to be, there's a great, um, there's a someone out there called the Peace Pilgrim who wrote this amazing book, Walking in Silence for, for so many years, but there's a phrase that she shares called combing the earth, you know, with your movement, with your feet, or if you're on a wheelchair, just combing the air. And I think that's a really beautiful invitation and a poetic invitation for something that that in some ways can feel and see, we can see is so basic, but really complicated when we think about built environment. We think about how fast things are changing and moving, especially online and inside of buildings. And so, um, yeah, I, it's such a huge part of the book <laughs> and my work. Yeah. Yes. So speaking of, you know, taking that time to just see what's going on around us. Um, I did pick like a little caption that I wanted to read um, nice. that will lead me into my next uh, question. So this is um, in the introduction. Um, it says, I also feel it's deeply important to name the role automobiles play in helping many people feel publicly and socially safe. With many of our origins and destinations sprawled out for miles between one another, there are often weary amounts of isolation and exposure. If we are not actively working to repair the harms of, of systemic racism, classism, homophobia, gender discrimination, catcalling, and all forms of oppressive human othering, walking or rolling in public becomes dangerous and life-threatening. This on top of an already devastating transportation environment. We cannot start to create spaces of personal, social, and public trust with non-automobile transportation if our environments remain inaccessible and hostile to walking, using a wheelchair and taking the bus. So we'll just wrap up here. Thank you for coming. We'll just like, there. ready. Uh, I'm ready. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> that's a lot. And I think that speaks to, you know, yeah. how so many of us feel about, mm -hmm. you know, creating these spaces. Okay, yeah, great. Like we're getting around with cars. 
but what about the people who are not? Um, what about just feeling safe, just, you know, as a person in your space? Um, and I, you know, this is going to lead me into asking you about pedestrian dignity and your work mm -hmm. with pedestrian uh, dignity. Um, first of all, I just think, you know, a lot of eyes have been open through, through your work. Um, so if, for those who aren't familiar, if you'd like to just kind of tell us about the birth of pedestrian dignity and, um, we'll start there and then I have, I have a few more questions about it. So, um, we could just, yeah. Thank you, Fred. And thank you for reading that portion of, yeah, it's so connected. Um, and it's so connected. What you read from is so connected to the just the experiment that has been pedestrian dignity. Uh, this was about three or four years ago when I, I've always been an artist. I've always been someone who's experimenting and creating, wanting to feel things like the hard things, the joyful things, the achy things, and I and how to experiment with that through hosting, walking, or rolling events, or creating content of different kinds, writing things like that. And I, I think I just I, I was getting frustrated as part of it but it's just there was just this it was getting louder and louder around the gap that I would experience when hosting events and this would be hosting just general community walking events specific like walk audit type events with engineers and planners and city folks and all of these just you know nuanced relationships moving together and I would I would recognize a, a big gap um, around the uh, kind of the lived experience of what a pedestrian goes through from A to B, the behavior of someone who, uh, you know, the millions of people that can't drive a car, the millions that maybe would choose to uh, walk or take transit more often or bike or other things um, if it was easier or safer or more healthy to do so. So this gap around lived experience um, informing policy or informing community connectivity or informing um, you know, just being really raw and real about redlining and segregation and where we think about just racism and classism in the built environment and how does one's lived experience, you know, in relationship to people who live in these areas um, and vice versa, informing each other through trust and relationship. How is all this help? Is it happening enough? There's, and so I just noticed this, this, this growing gap and I was like, okay, I, I want, as an artist, and as someone who was also trying to, um, I was intentionally trying to reach into younger audiences as well. And so I was like, all right, I'm just going to start experimenting with media around taking small video clips that tells, tell these kind of micro stories of lived experience uh, related to what it feels like at a certain intersection or doing it with other people and just kind of witnessing their story around where they have to go and where they're starting from. So it's very, the videos can be very specific to, um, you know, gaps in, in accessibility around an intersection, but it can also just, they can tell stories of how pedestrian mobility in particular has been basically systemically illegitimized, like, like it's not a legitimate form of transportation in the way we think about budgets and leadership and representation of staff and planning departments and things like that it's really something and very much in the u.s but all over the world it is it's kind of this side project when we have time and as an artist i've just got i got tired and so um i the last little note i'll share i, I use tiktok i use instagram uh hosting a lot of events in a network here in denver we have a discord channel um you know i'm 40 years old TikTok terrifies me still. It's overwhelming. It blows my brain out of all the sides. And the engagement with young people is, is incredible. Um, the feedback, the stories, and the messages that I'm getting from young people who are now taking these, just this, this, this pathway to civic engagement through the context of pedestrian mobility um, to their city councils, to their town councils. The, so I to their classrooms, they're taking their teachers out and their classmates out. So nutshell, the Pedestrian Dignity Project is just, for me, it's just been an experiment how to center the lived experience, how to be a little more raw and unapologetic, still collaborative, still community. We're all in the circle. We're all imperfect. It's not shaming people. It's not, but it's kind of grounding it in, in a lot of the harm but also in when there are good examples um, and, and celebrating the positive, but doing it from a 
a lived experience framework um, and, and media. So yeah, it, it's, it has taught me a lot uh, as I've been experimenting with it too, yeah. Great. And I totally forgot at the beginning, um, for those of you tuning in, um, please stick around till the end because we do have a giveaway of a signed copy of the book and a uh, virtual meet and greet with Jonathan. So we have picked a winner that we will announce at the end. Uh, so please uh, stick around. Uh, but you actually, you you went right into the next questions that I had, which was more about, um, have you have you seen where, you know, pedestrian, people who have been involved with pedestrian dignity have, you know, kind of taken parts of that and gone on into their own path of advocacy. Um, are there any like stories that stick out to you um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe with younger people, because I just think that's really important. Uh, you know, social media, of course, has its good and its bad sides, but, um, we can't deny that it can be a powerful tool in, mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways. So, you know, kudos to you for trying TikTok, because like, yeah, I'm right <laughs> with you on that one, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, is there, is there anything that sticks out, you know, somebody who kind of, you know, took the reins and made some change happen? Mm -hmm. stemming from being part of pedestrian dignity? Yeah, it's such a good question. And there are so many examples. I, I They're running through my head, but I think, um, you know, literally every week I'm getting messages from younger folks, probably ranging 18 to 25. That tends to be kind of a common TikTok or Instagram reel uh, mm -hmm. crowd. And it's a lot of very introductory civic engagement like questions. Um, so an example of something that was just two days ago was a message from someone um, asking that they wanted to present on this topic um, as a part of their capstone college course um, or a, a course within their within their study. And they wanted to interview and do some things to bring. And as a part of the their presentation, they're going to take their class out and show them a couple areas um, that that feel unsafe, but that also are positive and have discussion around it, like just two days ago. And so giving them just some tips through the through the media tool. Um, the other things that this is maybe a couple of weeks ago, there was um, a younger person in a very rural area who just had never connected to this as something they would see as that they could do anything about. Um, they were just really blown away, like, oh, my gosh, is there anything I can do? What can I I just research because there's a there's a way on on these media platforms you can create kind of video tutorials and stages and so she went to the how can I help tutorial path on the on the media channel and she said you mentioned you know going to a local town council or local town meetings so she tracked so in her message she's saying for I found the meeting I, I'm gonna go what do I say what do I do and I just so we kind of worked out this back and forth around like some different messaging fast forward to the day after she goes to them and she is just sending me every emoji under the sun around how empowering it was how exciting it was how everybody in the town meeting clapped and talked about how we don't get young people in these meetings and so that was just one example of and and it's it, what I just connected to that with I with some of the experimenting um through reels and TikTok because I'm with you it's, it, it's a love hate like it's social media stresses me out my hope is that it brings people out into the world like mm -hmm. hey I'm kind of fishing in like hey 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 and then go <laughs> get away from the tool for a little bit <laughs> um but it's uh one of the things that I really appreciate and part of the intention around experimenting with pedestrian dignity and also with kind of the longer term work at walk to connect is base building around and with audiences that may not default to being in advocacy or activism or being transportation professionals, just broad public connecting people on a civic engagement path through the lens of pedestrian uh, mobility. And so it's been really, really, really cool to see so many brand new people knowing, uh, learning kind of really early stage civic process through the context of my grandmother can't cross the street to get to her grocery store. So she has to wait two and a half hours sometimes to get an accessoride to take her to the grocery store. How do I make a difference? You know, like their context, because it's so broad at times is through relationship and, and proximity to their neighborhood. And I just, I love that. It starts from a really lived place a lot of the time. Yeah. So if you were to, 
I guess, give like a call to action for people, um, where would they start? Of course, going to a, you know, local town meeting, council meeting, that's key. But what are some other things that you would share with folks who are like, I don't know where to begin? Yeah. You know, I always, I, so I always encourage, there's a, um, there's a great uh, article actually that was reposted on the America Walks blog with my friend Annika, who um, does this amazing work through pedestrian space, but we co-created kind of a 12, 12 days of pedestrian advocacy article. And the first, the first tip is just start where you are and like, just mm -hmm. where, like, just kind of tracking your neighborhood, your behavior, your community, your neighbors, a family member, someone in your classroom, someone in your, any, just, just kind of examining like your own community from that lens of access, from that lens of safety, from that lens of, am I comfortable? Am I not comfortable? Um, and then from there, you know, just having, but I always, I always encourage that lived experience informing then some of the deeper, more technical questions a little bit. Go out and feel it first. I, listen to people who are using the bus and get to know them. So starting where you are, building relationships with people or going deeper with relationships you already have or are connected to <clears throat> that experience transportation differently than if you are a car driver solely. Um, so, you know, and or if, it, if it's already your lived experience, and you grind and you're trying to get to that bus stop and it's only once an hour or every other hour, it's encouraging people also then if that if this is your lived reality already um, to lean into making your personal experience a little more public and doing that in creative ways like personal storytelling, reporting things, just kind of engage, stoking the fire of agency around like, ah, I am a, I am a community member and my dignity and my mobility, it, it's valid like it's valid transportation. And so how do I experiment with making um, the experience a little more public? Yeah. Right, I love that. Um, and then touching base on um, Walk to Connect. So mm -hmm. that is also another um, piece that is shared in the book. And <clears throat> I know when you were uh, in the intro also talking about birthing Walk to Connect, um, you had said these these three kind of key phrases: stay awake, keep connecting, keep moving, and those were, um, you know, things that were really on your mind. Like especially when you wrapped up your uh, walk across the country. Um, can you kind of just expand on that a bit, and then just take us into how that walk impacted the creation of Walk to Connect? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, friend. I. There's so much there. It really is the 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 connecting with other people. So the what we talk about in our trainings, which is a part of what we've partnered now with Walk or with America Walks to host what we call leader trainings, and we maximize. We we talk about maximizing connection um, to each other, to the places around us, and to what our needs are and what's happening with ourselves, with our own personal journey, and. Um, so on this on the cross country walk, I mean, one of the most profound things for me was what I learned and what I experienced humbly moving alongside hundreds of people with different backgrounds and experiences, ages, uh, abilities, uh, stories of mobility in general, um, races, class. I, I, it was all over the map, and it was sometimes for a couple hours, sometimes for a couple days. People would just. I have a story in there about how homeschool, like families who homeschool drop their kids off. <laughs> you know, like there's some funny stories in there where I talk about like, you know, but you make these connections because you're moving in the outside world. The, the first chapter is titled Walking as Human Dignity, very intentionally. The second chapter is titled Walking as Humility, very intentionally. And there's something about the physical pace of whether it's on foot or on a wheelchair that to me you know you're shoulder to shoulder you're you're slowly moving forward you know often another another frame is like heart to heart subject to subject side by side side by side alongside so it's not as easy to objectify or maybe even be stuck in any one position or posture not like mm -hmm. often we can do uh, across tables or through screens and so you're moving with someone next to you, you know, moving forward, 
under a big sky, the trees are helping you breathe. You know, there's a great, um, a, another great book in neuroscientist Shane O'Mara, who talks about after 20 minutes of, of walking and or moving in an unhurried way, you're actively creating new neural pathways. And this is what I would experience all the time on this cross country walk. It was just, it was such a profound learning. Wow, I'm getting to know so many people in a way that feels grounded, open, spacious, even in the midst of our differences, like we're still finding common ground and the common ground often, at least to start, is that our human frames are humbly moving next to each other in, in an environment, in a park, in town, on a road. And so Walk to Connect was just this like, God, how, <laughs> how can I experiment with hosting more events, helping people to connect with each other in ways that feel um, that feel so human. It, you know, it, it's complicated. It, it, it's like, because it seems so common or basic, but as an intentional practice. So that's where Walk to Connect was birthed out of just hosting events. Um, I, you know, I was it was clear I was experimenting because my first walk was, come out and join me for 26 miles. <laughs> ah, I, nobody signed up for that. Uh, and then the next, well, as this uh, 23 miles next week, all that, you know, nobody signed up for that. So I started learning about my audiences <laughs> and how to <laughs> get creative. And we started training other leaders to focus on connection. And so part of that, they were nature-based walks, uh, mindfulness walks, and it was all focused on what was passionate for what, what brought a leader like to life, what gave the leader energy. We had cross-language, cross-cultural walks. I used to work in refugee resettlement, so we did a lot of work across different, uh, really different communities and backgrounds, moving together, learning from each other. Um, so, and then the one of the main spokes of the wheel was very connected to um, hosting events with uh, related to walkability and pedestrian dignity and accessibility. That if we're moving people alongside of each other, residents, engineers, planners, city electeds. If we're if we're moving next to each other, people who move with different abilities, mobility aids, different disabilities, if we're honoring the dignity of human, the, this big story, this big human condition story, while we're and then we're also talking about the safety of a road, and we're also creating new neural pathways, and we're also like the benefits of moving this way start to combine with some of the edges around change in, in mobility justice work. And so I, I, the ties of that just all felt so, um, so connected for me. And that's what kind of what you said at the beginning, the book is, it's <laughs> hopefully a positive roller coaster ride um, around a lot of different topics that for me just be, that, that became, that threaded together because of the, the benefit of, uh, moving this, moving the way we're made to move, um, to learn, to adapt, to connect, um, to heal, um, to go into conflict, things like that. Yeah. It does make me, um, it just makes me think I've done several, several, several walk audits um, in the past. And, uh, you know, it's one of those practices where, of course, when you do it, you can invite, you know, a couple people or you know, you can have a decent amount of people join you. And I know the first time I did one, I was actually working for city government and I was creating a walking route and I was told, you know, invite somebody from the mayor's office, invite someone from planning. And I was like, I don't know if I want to ask them to come with us on this walk audit. Like, and I worked, you know, I worked for city government, but I was leading this right. audit. And I just remember like, and this is, it wasn't even like some unknown path. It was a, a part of the city that people travel all the time, walk it all the time. Mm -hmm. But there was something about us all getting together. These are people that I have met before. Mm -hmm. I probably even have walked parts of this path with them before. But there was something about just being intentional about getting together for that act. Um, yeah. We just yeah. saw the space so differently. And, you know, there I know there have been uh, changes that have happened in, in the city around you know, making it safer for pedestrians and things like that. But, you know, to your point, like there really is something about just being side by side with people yeah. and moving like, you know, you can create things together and you can think things through and have like those important conversations where, you know, maybe if we were 
let's say in the mayor's office at the giant conference table, it might, you know, that vibe might not seem as open to have a conversation. But when you're moving with people, like they're really, it's just a different setting. It almost, you know, and it's whether, you know, you're like walking or rolling, like it just feels like you're just in that together mode with, yes. with folks. And so I do think that that, you know, is, is really impactful. I think I always, you know, obviously I encourage people to do walk audits. I love walk audits. And, um, and I always say like, once you do one, like you can't yeah. like not do one in your head then like going forward. Um, but yeah, and, and even if it's just also going back to, cause I know, you know, walking means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Yes no matter like how you do it, why you do it. Mm -hmm. um, and even for those who literally are just thinking of walking as like, I need to just get out, clear my head. Right, yep. Oh. Okay, I was like, oh gosh, did I freeze? <laughs> yes, you froze Nicole. Um, I froze Nicole. I, I well, I'll I'm sure she'll join us, but but take it away, Jonathan, if you have a response. I'm sure she'll she'll yeah that no, in. absolutely. I I love the stance. She's <laughs> um <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll just add like just ad lib alongside one of the things because I also you know walk audits as invitation strategies for hosting, especially from just a resident advocate lens too. Like, how can I just be a facilitator of inviting these complex departments to come together and 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 network alongside of a, a route um or a journey I, of I think mobility that's something, i think that's something that's not appreciated and and for right. the viewers i was a mayor of seattle for some time and i'd been a, a, an advocate for quite some time before that and it is quite often that the agency people particularly as a city gets larger don't have meaningful connections with us and that act of being of talking yeah. to each other with the community present is a different conversation that might occur um, within the government or a conversation that might not occur at all. One observation I had, Jonathan, was this is something about everyone being in the street together. It's very democratizing, right? Yes. There's an essential equality in that space that does that may not exist in a different space. You're nodding, share your thoughts. Yes. I mean, it's so much of like the um a lot of how I shape the one of the last chapters called walking as resistance a little bit, you know, this we're, we're, we're moving our humble frames. You know, it may not be specific to protest, but in some way it's 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 a little bit of protesting some of the default ways we organize and connect. So it may not be, you know, a conscious protest, but we're we're, we're moving into um, the public realm in a way that almost in and of itself holds this collective accountability. How do we care for this road? What are my roles to do so in a different way? And how do, we're all looking at each other. We're getting to hear each other's stories. We're breathing together. We're, and then I just keep going back to the new neural pathways. As you move, we're, we're creating new neural maps. <laughs> and so this author, Shane, the neuroscientist, I love it. He's just, he just repeats, you know, it's like, it, we need to be moving the way we're, we need to be prioritizing intentional practice around walking and rolling around complex social and political issues and how to, because of the neuro benefit. So, yeah, I think that combination of so that's, public. So that's, that's fascinating because yeah. I've always thought, you know, a phrase I've used in my advocacy is that, you know, community begins in, on the sidewalk outside your house. Yeah. yeah. Right. And for many people, it doesn't, if you never actually step on the sidewalk and you're in right. The isolated space of your car, the community begins at, at another part of your journey. But you're also saying community begins on the sidewalk, but self knowledge begins there as well, yeah. in a way that yeah. the very act of walking enhances our own uh, knowledge of ourselves and our own ability and capabilities in the world. Right. That's but yeah, and I think just even when I think about the the neuroscience of it, it's like our capacity to to be more to even be more open. Right. to the story of other the community right. the, the 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 elder who's standing in the median holding six grocery bags um because she can't cross because there's a crossings four blocks in either direction but she just got off the bus right at that you know right on that arterial road you know and so there you you so you've already opened your mind you're connecting across departments 
and you're now observing so empathy and openness starts to so there's just so much science to it that i think really applies to empathy community building networking across agencies who can uh, maybe make some decisions in a more in a in a quicker fashion than just emails and meetings um so the other know, thing i'll yeah go ahead. i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt the other thing no I, the only other thing I'll just I just add to the walk audit invitation, um, and this is kind of back to some of the lived experience stuff, but it's always just and it's never going to it's not about perfection, but leaning into who are you co creating these experiences with um, and always like always trying to be in co creation with residents um, and, and having resources to support them, whatever their needs are to be there and to be present in a healthy way. Um, and co-creating it with people who have different disabilities. And if you have a team of people who experience the world through a variety of disabilities, and you have residents who have not just showed up to your event, but you've co-created this together, and you're centering it around lived experience. It's not just, this is some kind of vague intersection that's just unsafe. It's actually the resident is grounding it in, I have to go get to the store here every day. I have to cross the street with my children and catch that bus. I, you know, you've you've shaped your your audit and your experience in this really, you know, that combination is is so is so powerful for obvious reasons um, in terms of grounding. Let's yeah. let's do a, a quick reference supply for folks. One a phrase we've been using here is walk audit, and yeah. we heartily recommend the AARP walk audit tool. Somebody in the in the comments just referenced how valuable that was to them. Yeah. If you go to the americawalks.org website under resources, you can find a link to that. AARP Livable Communities is a fabulous website on that. I had a question in the chat. What is the name of the book uh, that you were referring to about neural pathways? Do you recall? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's In Praise of Walking um, by Shane O'Mara. Yeah. In Praise it's of great. Walking. In Praise okay. of Walking. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> cool. Okay, I'm gonna go into some questions now. We have a bunch of questions Please. in the audience. So, so I, I was late to the viewers. I was actually meant to pop up here at about this time anyway, because I've been monitoring the questions in the chat. We've got some fabulous questions. Oh, good. Um, you know, this is um, a question from somebody uh, who appreciates your bringing up your inclusive language and acknowledging accessibility barriers. Um, since the 1990s, uh, Americans with Disability Act, Americans with Disabilities Act makes accessibility a federal civil rights issue. How do you suggest we advocate successfully for accessibility? Hmm. Uh, thank you for that question. I, um, I, am, I am learning as I go. I don't know that I have an answer to that other than my, my primary um, radar is through relationship. So I am always learning from people who have different disabilities, um, different access needs uh, related to a specific location or a place. So I, I'm almost, I would say the, the, the main thing is really being open to be in relationship first to like, how are we creating, co-creating um, events, uh, awareness, um, policies in relationship to, and that may be, you know, that may be said without needing to be said, but it's such an important, the relationship context is everything right. for me. And get out, of your um, own, get out of your own experience as a starting. Yeah. Point. Yeah. Collectively organizing with people who have a variety of, of, of lived experiences around, around ability and disability. Um, and the other, I would just, I, the thing that I feel is, there's so many things to say here, but I, I think one of the things that's very tangible for me is um, hosting lived experience events. So it's connected to the walk audit, but my primary like solution orientation for, you know, to not get so spread out and doing all the things. But for me, it's hosting with community, with people who I've built relationships and trust with hosting events that are um, that are pain point areas specific areas that have a lot of traffic around transit and use, and we're co-creating where this walk or role is gonna be with the people in community, but we're intentionally inviting the people who have a lot of decision-making power and very specifically elected leaders, because 
elected leaders moving with someone and or a group of people who experience disabilities on these corridors is a transformative experience with elected leaders who can influence resources and who can influence policies where then the staff and the planner so i'm always inviting planners and engineers to these things too but really i would just say consider going into relationship with people who experience a variety of disabilities hosting lived experience events with elected leaders who are in right. charge of being the bridge to the systems right. in those areas where you're taking people out. And that that in and of itself is, and using the walk audit tool to kind of guide some different checkpoints. Um, but it that's a powerful invitation. Um, can, I, can I put in a plug for a week without driving here? Jonathan? Yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. So we are America Walks is the national host of a week without driving. And um, for those listening, in the state of Washington, the Disability Mobility Initiative uh, from Disability Rights Washington, they brought together a coalition of non-drivers and they hosted a week without driving and invited decision makers and to, as well as members of the public, to, to try to have the experience of living a week without driving to see what that was like. So October 2nd through 8th, go to our website, it's under our advocacy link, we're, we're taking it national, we're inviting local organizations to participate with us and encourage this. So I think it hits the criteria you just laid out. Yes. Um, yeah, so Nicole, yes. glad to have you back. I jumped right in. I was- I was. Hi, Brad, we missed you. Thank by you. the way, by you the had way, an we... awesome dance pose though when you finished. It was, <laughs> oh, good, you were, good. were high-fiving the people. <laughs> good. <laughs> By the way, by the way, you have several fans in the Q&A. They, they miss you in York. I want to say Aww. that. Um, oh, yes. I love so, that. Um, Hello, Jonathan. Let me give, uh, let me ask another, another question here that I think goes to several questions. Um, I live in Fairfax County. My bus stop was hit by a vehicle. The street I walk on to get to the bus stop has a speeding problem. Where the only option we have to try to fix it is to get property owners to vote at crazy rates for improvements. Obviously, some type of local improvement district to pay for the improvement. Still, the county talks about safe streets for all and tells us to get out of our cars. How do we advocate when our elected officials are so hypocritical that we end up angry and disheartened? Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. I so one of the main reasons for me uh, shifting a little bit into pedestrian dignity work and just creative is because of a lot of that um, frustration and discontent, kind of the intuitive unrest around these different, these messages that would go out, but just not reflecting at all what we, what we see and experience in the built environment. And so I, I, on one side, I would just, I, enc I, I encourage and we need um, creativity and advocacy around how we are bringing in more and different people to be a part of this work. So we have more, we have more people collectively coming together and organizing when events happen, when poly, when cities and states need feedback on different initiatives, when, uh, you know, holding accountability to elected leaders. Like I just, we need more people paying attention and leaning into this space. Um, so I just, encourage creativity as an artist i'm always like yeah we got to bring poets spoken word people we got to bring we got to bring bring it into the heart and into the body uh so we can feel this is a crisis around public health it's a crisis around the millions that depend on transit and walking and biking it's it's a it's it's a crisis for a lot of reasons and all the benefits that we talked about earlier being blocked or 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 or, or not, not at all even available because of how stressful it is. It actually can decrease health in so many ways because of how stressful it is every day to get to that bus stop that just got hit by the car that no longer in the rain with snow. So I think creativity around storytelling and advocacy is really needed. How do we even bring in, how do we bring in artists? How do we get more younger people involved? How do we empower and, and plant seeds in, new areas uh, of our community spaces around um, just the breadth of work to be done around mobility. Um, I, I would just say the last, you know, this is connecting again, just to my, um, to my work in, in particular, but I, I think that the power of storytelling is so, is so important around um, not just in educating and inviting new people, but building relationships with people who have 
really important stories to tell around their lived experience and how do we get those stories more out front um, so that it's not just a, a concept, it's not a conceptual, it's an actual lived reality that so many people face every day. And how are we how are we making those stories more public with a lot of support for the people who are telling those stories? I, I would encourage people uh, who are on the who are who are watching to go into the Q and A chat. People are using that to also share some of their own comments, and there are some fabulous right. comments in there, just generally um, a, a, about the topics here and and their own experiences. Um, for example, someone mentions running for public office, so yeah, I can yes. raise my hand for that. Um, um, there's someone um, who is also a disability ad advocate and. Uh, says, yes, the first step is to listen, but also encourage your municipalities to develop transition plans to make their facility mm -hmm. roads federally accessible and also connect with their ADA coordinators yeah. um, if they have them. Um, I, I also want to bring up, you know, there's another person who asked the question, what do I do if advocacy didn't work? And mm -hmm. and I do want to say, I'm, I know I'm full of plugs here, but we do have our national walking college. We have yeah. our state walking colleges with AARP. We now have the Walk to Connect program. I, you know, I've I've been an advocate for a long time, and it's interesting. I think anger is one of the things that's always fueled my advocacy. You know, <laughs> anger is is the easiest yeah. to generate and the hardest to sustain. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to find something else as an emotion. You have to find something else to sustain. And I've I've always found it's other people is what keeps me there. It's the relationships with other people. Yeah. And and I also just want to affirm Jonathan's point about um, storytelling, because it's, it's, it is deeply frustrating to have all of the logical arguments why something should be different. In fact, we have so many great logical arguments why all of our communities should be yeah. more walkable. But it's ultimately emotion that moves um, the public and decision makers. Right? We, there are two ways of knowing. One way is with the head, and another is with the heart. Mm -hmm. And it's that it's the emotion, you know, about relationships, about efficacy, about that someone can make a difference, you know. So I, I want to say I hear the people in the comments threads talking about their examples, why they explained why something would be different to elected officials, and it did not change, right? You've got right. the you've got that, you've got that issue. The other thing I've off, uh, the other thing is, um, you know, it's challenging because sometimes you may be talking to a transportation engineer who actually does want to change something, but it's the elected yeah, officials, yeah. the roadblock. Yeah. Sometimes it's the opposite. So yes. yeah, you know, just the persistence. Nicole, yeah. you, you work for city government as well. What are your observations <laughs> on what would you recommend to somebody about dealing with city governments that don't seem to listen when, when information is shared with them. I definitely think keep showing up to like your council meetings. And, um, you know, I, I was in an interesting position because where I, I worked for city government, I also lived in the city where I worked at, at the time there was a residency requirement. And so, and one of the street, the street I lived on, there were accidents quite frequently. And by accidents, I mean, a lot of near misses and a few crashes that I saw where I was thankful that the people walked away. And this was a one way, supposed to be 25 mile per hour road. Um, and I was always in this strange space where how do I, you know, Oh, Nicole, I was so ready. I was like, wait, <laughs> um, we'll, have to, we'll have to put this in the follow-up blog post yeah well what i want to add something that's coming up a little bit i also you know the the burnout is real it is real and i i think if you have been advocating for a long time or if you're leaning into this and you're not seeing changes one of the things that i've experimented a lot with walk to connect and it's similar to what mike said around just the relationships and keeping the people involved what nicole said about continuing to show up but there's just there's so much room kind of back to the creativity of how we can host these events um i i'm always encouraging i just had a great meeting yesterday with 
some leaders that were just trained via Walk to Connect America Walks and through AARP in Minnesota and all the leaders had all these great ideas. And in the training we encourage, these walking events can be focused on health, on getting to know your parks, on older adults, on different topics and themes. And you can integrate advocacy seeds and pedestrian safety into events that may, that maybe don't need to be as focused if you're experiencing some burnout or if you're wanting to get creative with moving different people. Um, so that's just something that we do a lot with Walk to Connect is we try to get into new spaces and host events that maybe are, are themed not as a walk audit, but are themed uh, with, a, with a little more, with a different topic, but uh, we interlace pedestrian safety and advocacy in the, in the topics of, of these, you know, in the agenda of the walking events. And it, and it can be really great seeds for new people getting into the pool and into the mix with different skills and talents and, and resources, yeah. So let's roll to, uh, I got a couple of other questions. Some of them are for America Walks. Um, um, hello, Peg Staley. Um, is Amer America Walks doing any state or national effort to change the laws, practices, so sidewalk maintenance is responsibility of the public agency? Um, my answer to that is yes, but not enough. This is, um, stay tuned, we're actually going to do a webinar and survey on, you know, practices across the country on this. Um, we've been collecting data, and it is almost always um, the law says that it's the responsibility of property owners to take care of the right of way. Um, but the practice is that very few cities or states enforce that and they selectively invest in walkways. So it's a broken system. Um, absolutely. And, uh, and, and, it, and there's actually a great example in Denver where Jonathan lives, where there was a citywide ballot measure to get sidewalks paid for. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, more than that, please. Jonathan, any yeah. thoughts? Yeah, Denver, so 307, you can look up um, Initiative 307, an amazing community effort. Um, it's property owners that are paying into it. It's 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 still complicated. It's probably not what we want to see big scale in terms of cities really legitimizing pedestrian mobility um, from the inside out in a way. We have so much work there. Um, so, but definitely check it out as a locally organized, people voted it in. It's 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 one of a kind in a lot of ways. And so it's something that we can all learn from. Um, I would just, one of the main educational pieces that I'm constantly experimenting with through TikTok videos and Instagram videos and hosting these events is just reframing people's, uh, the default of that we, of that the car mobility, the car centric system that's kind of this unquestionable has access, goes through complex districts, can get anywhere it needs to go. Um, and there's so much room for us to experiment with. Do we treat pedestrians like we treat drivers as a, as a form of transportation? And that kind of leaving that question for people in all these different scenarios is really right. important because there's just this untapped default that even with people who might be advocates or leaning in saying, I support safe streets, but there's a default that still puts pedestrian and bike and multimodal and active transportation and transit into an other category instead of an integrated category. And I think that's the, that we, we, we have a lot of work to, to keep bringing that up, keep, keep curating creative invitations around that tension. I think that's, it's a, the younger folks are just so responsive to it. They're like, wow, I never thought about it that way. Never thought about it that way. I think that, I think Jonathan, I think that's a close, right? And if, like that if we're gonna change laws <laughs> and change streets, we have to change minds and cultures yeah, yeah. first. And, and that's a conversation at a time. Nicole, any closing thoughts you'd like to give us before I roll into the closing slides? I'd like to give a, a plug of not having the internet provider that I have, but I won't do that. <laughs> um, I should I announce the the winner now? Oh yes, please. Hi, yes, we please. can have like a little little drum roll. So our um, our winner for a signed copy of the book and a virtual meet and greet with Jonathan is Katie Livernash. Katie Livernash. So we will reach out. We have your contact information. Congrats. Um, please share with us what you think of the book when you're done reading it. 
Um, and just thanks so much for being here, Jonathan. And uh, thanks, Mike, for, for stepping in there for me. And uh, mm -hmm. I'll pass it to you for the slides. <laughs> advocacy is a, thank advocacy you. is a team game. Advocacy yes. is a team game. Yes, sport. thank you, Nicole. Thank yeah. you. And of course, we're really excited to have Jonathan on our team too. Um, if you're interested in tapping into Jonathan's expertise or the other people he's worked with, and he's got a tremendous crew of folks he's worked with on putting together walking and rolling events, trainings for walking movement leaders, go check out our Walk to Connect page at America Walks. Walk to Connect is now a program of America Walks. So we get to work together a lot more closely, which is fabulous. Um, please consider making a donation to keep our programming thriving. Every bit counts. We've we've had success from, from some major institutional partners, who, but they tend to fund really specific programs. In order for us to get out there and do uh, kind of the free ranging work of seeing issues, responding immediately, being able to support the people who call us up for help, um, the the these individual donations, particularly the recurring monthly ones, are incredibly valuable. So um, our most innovative and creative work comes from individual donors. So if you enjoyed this, if you like the work we're doing, please consider supporting us into the future and um, register and tune into our next webinar, the Community Connectors Program. Basically, we will be providing technical assistance in partnership with Transportation for America, uh, NUMO and others to um, groups that are working to remove highways or fix dangerous arterials that run through their communities. It's a, it's a, 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 a substantial grant from a, a foundation in which the goal is to provide resources to the people on the ground trying to make better communities. So learn more about this, go to our website, you can learn more there too. And thank you all for joining us. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, other social media platforms, and uh, look forward to working with you to build, build better communities together. Yes. Thank you all. Bye. Thank, thank you, you, Mike. Thank you, America Wax. Thank you, Nicole. Jonathan. Thank you.